This is Erica Lee San Mittman, and you're watching the TV Writer Podcast. This is Gray, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, episode 94, for Easter Monday, March 13th, 2020. Happy Easter if you celebrate it. Today we have an interview with Erica Lisanne Mittman, showrunner of Timeless and the upcoming Paradise Lost on Spectrum Originals. We'll get to that in a couple of minutes. This episode is sponsored by Pilar Alessandra of OnThePage.tv. Be sure to check out all the resources and classes on her site, and she also offers one-on-one -on -one coaching via Zoom. TV Writer Podcast viewers can get 10% off on any of her services. Just reach out to Pilar directly and tell her I sent you. Speaking about sponsoring, there's a new way that you can support the podcast. These weekly podcasts don't just happen. There are a lot of operational costs like hosting, web server, equipment, and quite a bit of time editing and, and compressing. You can visit tvwriterpodcast.com slash support to find out how you can become a patron of the podcast for as little as 25 cents per episode. I hope these are worth 25 cents, but check it out, tvwriterpodcast.com slash support. This interview with Erica is awesome, and you're going to love it. Enjoy. Well, I want to welcome Erica Lisanne Mittman, showrunner of Timeless and the upcoming Paradise Lost on Spectrum Originals. How are you doing, Erica? I'm great, thank you. How are you? Doing great. Um, well, this is really cool. Um, this is actually my first Skype interview in a long time. I, I did over... 150 of them back in the day and then moved in person and kind of didn't look back but uh it's it's kind of neat to be able to do this even though we're all figuring out this virus and sheltering at home and all that kind of <laughs> thing i appreciate you you taking your time um to do this interview today no problem thanks for having me cool um speaking of the speaking about the virus um i do want to ask sort of professionally um how you've been impacted by it um if and uh, and just sort of how you making out um thank you for asking um actually um i'm doing fine because um i have been uh, developing right now and so i was working from home for a change which is unusual for me but i was working from home before this happened so it wasn't a big change for me other than that my wife and children were now working at home with me so uh. that was a little bit of a change to have more more humans in the house at the same time but um you know in terms of in terms of what i'm doing right now it didn't have a major effect other than that now you know all of our meetings are on zoom and you know all these other platforms so I mean, it saved me some commute time of driving yeah. places, you know, to go do pitch meetings and stuff. So now yeah. I do pitch meetings in my guest room where I can hide from my children. Well, actually, I, you know, it's funny because I, I think that, uh, and a lot of people are saying this, um, that in, in past sort of calamities, we end up figuring out a way to work. But that way that we figure out ends up becoming part of how we do things. And I think... I mean, we're, we're, we're all talking about when is this going to end? When are we going to be going back to work? And I think there's going to be a lot of people who are hesitant to have in-person meetings for a while. I think we might be seeing a lot more of this anyway. I think so, too. I think there's going to be a new normal. And it's funny, um, one of the first things that occurred to me because I'm developing shows right now, because I'm writing from home, is like, how do you write for the present day? Because I don't feel like, you know, we, we just write things as though people just, you know, go and have conversations with each other, you know, mm. like, you know, writing anything sort of has to keep keep in mind where we're going to be a few months from now when we come out of this pandemic. I, you know, I, I believe we will come out of it and all of that. But like, I think things are going to look a little different, especially in the immediate future. I don't know that people are just going to suddenly recongregate in bars or suddenly, you know, go back into writers rooms right away. And I think there will be a period of time. And there will also be a wow, that was easier. You know, we didn't, ha I didn't have to, I, you know, I live in the Valley. I live in Tarzana. I don't have to drive to, you know, uh, why, why am I driving over to the West side to Santa Monica for a meeting and spending an hour and a half tra in traffic to get myself back home? You know, like mm -hmm. it starts to be like, well, th this is easier. This is safer. And, you know, I, I think, I think we'll see a lot of, a, a lot of changes and it's hard to predict what exactly they're going to be, but I do think there will be a sort of new normal. The world will look very different after this. I feel bad for people who are developing medical shows right now because I think the worlds of hospitals are going to look very different. I think a lot of things are, you know, I think there's a lot of things that we're changing. Somebody somebody said that right now we're we're building the we're building the plane while it's in the air. 
you know, we're figuring all this out like in real time while it's happening. And I think once those things get set, there are some things that are, there are some things that are going to go back to normal. We will leave our houses again, you know, but there are some things that will just be different about the way we do business. I think we'll be a lot more conscious, you know, on set, we're going to have to be a lot more conscious of, you know, the, of, of germs of the, you know, of how close we are to each other of that kind of, you know, personal contact that we all have and writer's rooms. And I think, I think probably it will be more okay to like stay home sick because like that's always been, you know, in this industry, like you don't stay home sick unless you're dying, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that's got to change. I think people have to be like, you know what? I feel a little sick. I'm going to, you know, I'm okay. Um, you know, maybe I'll Skype in from home, you know, just, just to be safe, that kind of thing. I think, you know, you're going to see a lot more of that, you know, when rooms start to reconvene, you know, if people are sick, they'll say, you know what? Stay home. If you're really sick, take the day off. It's okay. If you're a tiny bit sick and you want to come in remotely and not infect us, we'll do that. You know, I think I think that's what we're going to see. But hmm. it's hard to predict, you know. Yeah, well, those are very fair points. I, I saw somebody posting um, today on, on Facebook that even in, when they're watching stuff on, on TV or watching movies now, they're like, oh, those people are too close. Oh, oh, those people are so close. And, and it really does affect how you see things, even the entertainment you watch. Um, but I think some of the coolest stories that I'm hearing are of the things that are enabled. Like I heard about 300 researchers that all banded together um, through the Internet to f figure out an open source ventilator. Um, mm -hmm. And, and there, there was a sharing of minds that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And, and I think there's got to be ways that this is actually going to affect the writing experience. I, I remember I had um, a writing partnership way, uh, way back, and we just wrote together so well. He had some marriage problems, and he had to move to a different city, and we broke off the, the, the relationship. Maybe we didn't have to. <laughs> It'd be, like Maybe we could have continued to write online together. But we just didn't think of it because we couldn't see each other face to face. And maybe there will be some more things like that. I know a lot of people are talking about, well, hey, do I really have to be in L.A. anymore if we're doing things um, online? So I'm definitely it'll be interesting to see how things change. Yeah, I mean, I think also like we are so you know ready to fly to London at the drop of a hat. Like, oh, we have, you know, we're going to go to fly to London to do a meet in person and then fly back. And I think you're, you're going to see a lot more of do I really need to fly somewhere for this or can I do this online? And that's better for the environment overall. You know, I think, mm -hmm. you know, we've gotten like, we've gotten so used to flights being so easy and relatively, you know, cheap that you have executives and writers and producers and everybody flying all over all the time. And I think there will be a lot more consideration of like, do I have to fly there or can we just do this online once we've gotten so used to doing things online, you know, mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's, you know, and maybe that's good. Maybe there, maybe it's a good thing if we're not, you know, expending so much of that, you know, uh, carbon or whatever to, uh, you know, to fly. Cool. I'm going to try to do to, to an intelligent segue here. Speaking of a different way to work, and we're going to rewind a little bit and go back to the beginning of your career. And, and I know I don't want to talk about breaking in stories too much, but you had a really unconventional thing that happened very early in your writing career and that was um you were one of the sort of pioneers for sony pictures digital um <laughs> entertainment in in when everybody was trying to figure out what what can we do online you actually did a bunch of stuff can you tell me that that story how you got involved in it what it did for your career absolutely um sure i mean i came at it uh, you know like most people do i think sort of sideways um i started my career as an assistant uh, which is what when writers come to me and say how do I break in? How do I, I want to write for television like you do? What do I do? And I said, well, get in a room, you know, get, get on a writing staff, be a showrunner assistant, be a PA, be a writer's assistant, you know, get yourself into that room. I was a writer's assistant slash script coordinator for on and off for about 10 years. And, um, that was, that was my training ground. That was my graduate school. Um, I like to say Dawson's Creek was my graduate school, um, because I, um, I took a job working for a showrunner, um, who was uh, at Dawson's Creek at the time. And then um, he left and I stayed on to be become the writer's assistant at Dawson's Creek. And while I was there, I was approached to do some work on the website. And as you pointed out, this was very new at the time. You know, this was one of the first 
web extensions, they called it, of a series that hadn't been done before. I mean, it was a brand new thing, you know, that Sony was trying because Sony, which was, I mean, back then it was actually Columbia TriStar and it was Columbia TriStar Interactive because, you know, as they, you know, they, they wanted to have this, uh, you know, this web element to it. And um, the geniuses over at Columbia TriStar Interactive came up with this idea to create what they called Dawson's Desktop, which was the idea was that you would go online and you could be at Dawson's computer and you could read his diary and you could, you know, uh, look at his, uh, you know, his calendar and you could read, you know, basically everything you would see if you were, you know, inside Dawson's computer and, um, and people could chat with Dawson and all this stuff. Like that was the idea they had, which was very, I mean, now it's sort of commonplace and, you know, even passe, but Back then, this is sort of late 90s, this was very revolutionary. Nobody had ever done anything like this before. And so because I was at the show, because I was a writer's assistant on the show, they felt like you're somebody who could do this and could have the, you know, the ear of the writers and run these things by the writers and stuff. And so I started doing, while I was there, I started doing the website um, and doing this uh, Dawson's desktop experience. So online, I was Dawson. You know, I had teenage mm-hmm. girls writing emails and I was answering them, you know, and, um, you know, and writing Dawson's diary and we expanded it to do all the characters. And, um, and so that was like sort of a, you know, it was a unique experience. And as that grew, they asked me to come over as they became Sony and they, you know, became Sony interactive instead of Columbia TriStar. They asked me, you know, to come and work full time for them and produce the website. And so I started doing this website full time. And while I was there, Sony was starting this initiative way ahead of its time before all, you know, before Netflix, before mm-hmm. there were TV shows online, they were starting to come up with this thing and they called it Screen Blast. And, you know, they had these little, you know, sort of five minute webisodes. And, you know, one of the things they wanted to do was have a drama channel. And um, the idea was pitched um, by Paul Steuben, who was the executive producer of Dawson's Creek, of a show about a girl in a room. Um, and, uh, her, it was called Rachel's Room, and the girl was named Rachel. And the idea was that she um, was a, she was a teenager who felt really alone after her dad died, and uh, you know didn't wasn't connecting with her mom. They weren't getting along, and so she went online to connect with the people around her. And so it was a fiction, but it was sort of meant to look really rough and real. And Maggie Grace was the actress, and um, and uh, Chris Pike and myself, who was, uh, who I was also working with at, um, Sony at the time, we wrote the, you know, we created the show and wrote the, uh, episodes and, um, you know, we wrote about 55 minute episodes, wow. um, that Maggie Grace starred in and they were just like little snippets of life of a girl in a room mm-hmm. and people, you know, it was, it was a small thing, but it was a big thing because like all these people from all over the world got really invested in it. I had people, I I still am in touch with some of the people who wrote in at the time because I became, you know, well, Maggie Grace was the on-camera Rachel. I was fielding these chat rooms every day. Chat rooms were a big thing. And, um, you know, and I was chatting online in character as Rachel and people, these teenagers were telling me like their deepest, darkest secrets and, you know, like pouring their heart out to Rachel. And then what happened was uh, 9-11 happened. And that kind of changed everything in terms of this, you know, this growing area of the business because it wasn't making any money yet. And when they first started it, they knew they were like, we know this isn't going to make money for some time, but we'll get there. And then when everything sort of changed, it became priority shifted. We can't do this anymore. We need to do things that make money, you know. And so they basically sort of abandoned the initiative. And and I was like, but but she's their friend. Like, you know, (laughs) you can't cancel their friend. And so I wrote to them as me, as myself and said, you know, this is me. I've been doing the voice of Rachel. And like, what was interesting was that they understood that Rachel was a fictional character, but they wanted to play, you know? Mm. So they behaved as though she was real. It wasn't like we were pulling one over on them. They knew Rachel wasn't real, but they liked playing in the fiction. And so, um, you know, so I wrote to them as me and I was like, okay, you know, if you guys still want to write to me, you can, but I don't feel comfortable, you know, pretending to be somebody once we're not doing the show anymore. So Um, and some of them did, and some of them I stayed in touch with, but like these kids from all over the world. And so, um, that was a really unique writing experience. I've never, wow. you know, written any that format before, or, you know, done anything in that way where I was sort of in character interacting with the audience. Um, it, it quite like that, you know, and, um, and so, um, about, you know, after doing that for Dawson's Creek for so long, I then sort of 
segued back into after after 9-11 and after that industry kind of fell apart for a while there wasn't going to be any web writing for some time I didn't and I want my ambition when I moved out here I wanted to write for television so mm. I got back into doing writer assistant and script coordinating and you know sort of came back to that world and then was offered a staff position on a show called South of Nowhere which is a teen soap for yeah. the VN which at the time was the the teen Nickelodeon uh, you know, they were running to grassy, uh, is the more famous show, but, um, South of Nowhere was kind of a com companion piece for that. And that was my first staff position that, uh, that I got hired on after it was a very natural segue from having done all the writing for Dawson's Creek, um, ancillary content. Very cool. Um, that is a really neat story. And, and I think the neat thing about it, as, as you share it, it's kind of the feel of what a lot, a lot of writers shared with me. Um, when Twitter sort of first started, and they started being able to interact with fans um, on Twitter. Um, but this was long before social networks. Yep. This was long before any of that. It was chat rooms. I mean, that was it. There was no... And I would say, yeah, the most similar experience I've had in terms of fan interaction was, what well, fast forward to Timeless, because mm -hmm. the Timeless fans, there's nobody more passionate than Timeless fans <laughs> on Twitter, yeah. let me tell you. Yeah. And you know, because we were trying so hard to fight for that show, we would do, we would live tweet every time the show was on and like the writers were there and the actors were there. And, you know, we were online interacting with these fans, sometimes too much, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but the, um, but that, that was the next time I saw that almost that kind of fan experience where you're inter where you're literally directly responding to and interacting with your fans. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, now let's talk about South of Nowhere because um, sure. you were a, a very new staff writer and I think it was in your your first or your second year there that you were nominated for a WGA award and you won a Humanitas award uh, for one of the episodes. Tell me about that. <laughs> oh, my God. I lucked out. Um, <laughs> um, you know, because it was a teen show, it, I don't want to minimize this, but because it was a teen show, it was nominated in the kids category. Hmm. But we were covering some very, you know, sort of mature subject matter. And, um, you know, and I think it was just a matter of like I you know for me South of Nowhere was really special because it was a teen soap about a gay teenager it was about a gay teenage girl and um you know they I came into it in the third season the first season was um about a teenage girl who um you know figures out that she's gay and then the second season was kind of her coming out process and by the time I got there it was really just she's a gay teenager in the world um and um you know, this was, you know, me, you know, I'm also gay. And so it was something that I connected to and related to. And I wanted to tell a story about um, this girl coming out to her grandmother. And the reason I wanted to tell that is because my grandmother died when I was 17. I did not get that opportunity to ever share that with her. And, um, and I liked the idea of a character who was very, very close with her grandmother. Um, and, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to tie it up neatly with a bow and say, everything's okay. And I wanted to really explore the dynamic because the show had already created a situation where her mother reacted so dramatically negatively to her being gay. And I wanted to understand where that came from. And so I created, the, the character of her grandmother had not been previously on the show. We created this relationship and this character. And basically the story of that episode was grandma comes to visit and Spencer, the lead character, has to, you know, uh, her, basically her mother tells her, don't say anything to your grandmother about this. Don't tell her, don't tell her, you know? And so she's trying to abide by her mother's rules. She's trying to dance around it. She's trying to hide the truth, but her grandmother, you know, is saying sort of, you know, some pretty terrible things. And it's the mother character who finally steps in to protect her daughter, you know, and uh, all about that of the mother who's been saying, just don't tell your grandmother, who's trying to avoid the issue, who's trying to avoid, avoid the you know emotions going into that then steps in actually to defend the daughter that she was so critical of you know previously but she can't watch you know her mother sort of do we oh I did this to you you know and you know it was all about you know how did these family dynamics come in place and instead of having the grandma oh you know you're right love everything's cool we wanted to be a little bit more real and say, you know, like grandma, grandma doesn't accept it at the end. It's not a happy ending. Grandma goes mm -hmm. home and she's pissed off. But, um, but Spencer and her mother have gotten closer as a result of this experience, 
you know, and that's, that's basically what the story was. And I think, you know, I mean, I think it helped that we were up against like, you know, Rugrats or something, you know, but like, (laughs) uh, um, you know, we were, we were up against sort of apples and oranges kind of programming. Um, we weren't up against, you know, we weren't up against Grey's Anatomy. We weren't up against the big shows, but, um, but it meant a lot, you know, it meant, Mm. it meant a lot to me at the time to have that story that was so sort of personal to me, you know, be something that won any kind of awards. You know, or was nominated in case of Writers Guild. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, you got that award, but tell me, sort of, in that in that time, how were you positioned? Now, now that you were on staff, uh, was it around then that you got an agent, or was it earlier? Um, I had an agent. I had an agent before I was on staff. I changed agents. Uh, I, I've changed agents a couple of times, but. I actually, um, I first signed, the first time I signed with an agency was when I was an assistant at Dawson's Creek. Oh, really? And, you know, they thought, yeah, like, um, they basically, the agencies, you know, were thinking that all of us assistants at Dawson's Creek were up and coming. And, you know, so I signed at, it was UTA at the time. I signed at UTA. Um, they started sending me off to meetings. I was so green. I did mm. not know what I was doing. I, I, you know, they, I, I mean, I, I, I had idea what, you know, how to go about these meetings, how to navigate them. You know, I had only been an assistant for a couple of years. I'd only been in this town a couple of years. So, um, you know, it was really, um, you know, it, it was, I was super naive and, you know, didn't really know what I was doing to be honest, but, uh, um, you know, and then, um, they, you know, I think the agencies thought, Oh, well, you know, she's going to get staffed at Dawson's. Well, then as things happened, like they threw out the whole writing team, like mm-hmm. new writers came in. I didn't know any of them, you know, at the time. And so, it was, you know, out with the old and in with the new. And I stayed, I, I actually, I, I continued to do the desktop stuff. I continued to do the, you know, all of the um, web extension stuff. Um, but um, but I, I did not end up staffing at Dawson's. And um, the, you know, the agency grew tired of me not staffing, you know, kicked me to the curb. And it was, you know, my first experience with that. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then I, um, I was assisting a uh, showrunner who is a mentor and good friend of mine. His name is Dana Barada. And I was working with her on a pilot. Um, and, um, and that pilot was for the, uh, it, was, it, was, it was the, uh, the UPN before it, before, when there was a network called the UPN. And, uh, mm. you know, very close to getting picked up. And at that point, um, I was positioned to be staffed on that show. But then, um, then we didn't get picked up. But in the interim, I got signed uh, at Gersh. So um, I was signed with an agency, um, took meetings, ended up um, getting that job on South of Nowhere, um, more through people I know, honestly, than through the agency. Like I just, I, you know, when you're, the reason I advise people to take assistant work is not just because, it's, it's twofold. One is because you learn a lot. Like I said, it's graduate school. Like you will learn more just by being in a room and being around other writers than you will ever learn you know, in any kind of academic setting, you just learn by doing. Um, but the other reason is, um, there, the, everything, so much is about relationships and you build relationships by doing that. You do a good job as an assistant, you know, you have a sunny disposition, you come to work, happy to be there, ready to go, ready to help the writers, like then they will want to help you. And so, you know, so I made a lot of friends and built a lot of relationships in my time working as an assistant. Um, and those relationships were what, were what got me almost all of my staff positions for some time. Um, but, um, I, uh, uh, but anyway, so, uh, you know, I was with, I, I was with Gersh for a while and then, uh, and then I ended up moving over to WME, um, in the, it was right around the time of the writer's strike in 07, <laughs> um, when I switched agencies and, um, I, um, yeah, so I moved to, so I moved to WME then, and, um, and I, I love my ex agent there. We're all obviously in this, you know, agency conflict right now, which has nothing to do with the, you know, personal relationship that we have mm-hmm. with our, agents. it has to do with like bigger picture things. So, um, I, you know, I hope to be back with my agent there when we are all officially back with our agents. Um, but for now, um, I have a manager and I have a lawyer and, you know, just, uh, doing our thing. Yeah. Did that answer your question? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think so. I think so. Um, like more because uh, because so there's so much information out there on um, breaking in on how to get that first staff writing job, but then there's very little information out there on okay, then what next? And um, I know uh, Javier and Jose did did a little class at the the WGA recently, um, trying to address this, like 
trying to fill the gaps in in that mid-level area. Um, when you got on staff, what was your plan? What, how were you looking at how you you were going to get ahead? <laughs> I, you know, I wouldn't. I wish I could say I had a plan. I didn't really have a plan. I had a, you know, I had an agent and I had relationships. And you know, um, what I will say is it's hard to have a plan because you know what I plan to keep doing South of Nowhere and then South of Nowhere got canceled and then there was a writer's strike and I was out of work. And then, um, and then what happened was a show came up called Legend of the Seeker, um, which was a syndicated fantasy series, something I knew nothing about, but the showrunner was somebody who knew me from when I was an assistant. Again, I did a lot of assistant work and the showrunner knew me and you know, there's always an advantage and you know, you're good. You're going to hire somebody, you know, before you're going to hire someone you don't know. You just, you know, ideally you just are. Because, you know, you that that's, um, you know, there, there, there's a level of trust. There's, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you when you when you can, you want to hire somebody, you know. And so um, I was hired on uh, this um, on Legend of the Seeker. I was again a staff writer. I did staff writer three times, wow. um, which is becoming more and more not. Un it's becoming more and more common when I did it. I felt like this is insane. <laughs> but like my first job. But, you know, when I got to Legend of the Seeker, they said, oh, you haven't worked for a major studio before. And that was ABC Studios. So they said, you have to do staff writer again. I'm like, OK, fine. Then I got hired um, from Legend of the Seeker. I went on to Medium. And at Medium, uh, they said, well, you've not done a show for a major network before. <laughs> it's like, really? it's all the same thing, guys. You know? wow. So um, so I did staff writer three times. But luckily, um, uh, you know, and on Legend of the Seeker, I came in on season two, and because the syndication model was basically falling apart, we got canceled after that season. So, you know, we didn't get to keep going. Luckily, um, my boss at Legend of the Seeker um, was friends with Rob Doherty. Actually, mm -hmm. my boss at Legend of the Seeker was Ken Biller, and Ken Biller used to, Rob Doherty, um, who is now, you know, very, very well known and fantastic mm -hmm. and, you know, famous showrunner who created elementary um and he was showrunning medium at the time mm -hmm. and he um used to be ken biller's assistant so you see my point oh, about really? doing it oh, okay yeah so ken recommended me to rob and rob hired me on medium and medium we were in the middle of season seven when we're all called down to set like and, and that was not a show that you went to set there are some okay. shows that are big on set some shows that you know and uh you know, they called us all down to set around you know a couple of weeks before Christmas, and we were like, okay, either Patricia or either something terrible has happened to Patricia Arquette, or we're being canceled. <laughs> and um, and the answer was we're being canceled. Oh. And um, the one only good thing I will say about that is because um, two things that are good were good, that worked out well about that. One was that um, my my agent this, by this point I'm at WME, and my agent had built into my contract because I had done staff writer twice already mm -hmm. that. If the show got a back nine, um, I would get for the back nine. I would get story editor. Oh, I would get nice. that bump yeah. from staff yeah. to story editor. And we had we went one episode into our back nine order <laughs> <laughs> before we were canceled. Wow. And it was literally like, okay, you're a story editor because you were a story editor for this one last episode. So wow. coming into um, and the other reason it was good is because. Um, it, I, at first, I thought, I'm like, this is a disaster. At this point, I had two babies. We had just had twins. Oh, I had young, you know, I had little ones. And the show being canceled totally unexpectedly, you know, out of nowhere in December. And mm -hmm. I'm like, what am I going to do? You know, but um, cable shows are off cycle now. You know, now everything's off cycle of us. But like, um, but uh, the, a, a position, the Dexter writers room was getting ready to get started for their sixth season. And I had a friend who, again, from when I was an assistant, she was a fellow assistant with me who had gone on to do Dexter for the previous five seasons. She recommended me for Dexter. And um, and that was, I would say, the big jump, the big bump in my career was Dexter mm -hmm. because it was a high profile show, very successful show, cable, edgy kind of show, which is a good kind of credit. And uh, I had never watched the show before, but I was like, oh, yeah, I love the show. And I spent... <laughs> Spent the, and it was like, and I had an interview in like four days. I spent those four days, like, and remember, I have young children too, yeah. like watching two seasons at once, like on two different computers, <laughs> on everything, you know. And I'm writing to my friend, like, okay, what do I really need to watch? Like, tell me yeah. which episodes I need to, you know. So cramming basically for the, you know, for the uh, meeting for that job. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
And that, you know, but because it was only because Medium got canceled when it did that the timing worked out for me to get that job on, on Dexter, you know, which was really the best thing that happened to my career. I stayed with Dexter for three seasons um, until the very end of Dexter. And, um, you know, and it's still a, it is still a, a credit that has helped me tremendously, you know, going forward. And that was really, I would say, when my career took off, you know, um, was with was a Dexter. Very cool, very cool. And you bumped up a couple levels during Dexter. I did well because of that. Because of the, I came because I had had story editor on Medium. My agent was able to get me a bump to start as executive story editor on Dexter. Wow! So, so you, you had one episode, <laughs> and then I missed. Yeah. Wow. So I kind of, and then the thing is, the truth is like, I, it was where it kind of caught me up to where I should have been hmm. having done staff writer three times. So it kind of caught me up a little bit. So I did one season as an executive story editor there then, um, because I stayed there and these things are built into contracts. So, you know, I moved up to co-producer the following season and I left extra as a producer. Hmm. So, um, it, you know, that, that was the, um, the big thing that made that difference and helped in those very, jumps. Very cool. So, so at that point, um, I saw rev reference that you had been developing series with CW. Um, it was that sort of during that time or was that a little later? I did a lot of, I actually, um, I developed, that was right after I finished Dexter, but while I was at Dexter, I developed two pilots, one for MTV and one for, um, ABC family. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was crazy. I was, I was writing two pilots while I was on a show wow. and, and while I had you know, two young children. <laughs> so that was a, a little bit of a bananas time in my life, but, um, it was, um, but it was good experience. You know, you learn from everything you do. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did those, I did those two pilots. Um, I had done a pilot for the CW. Yeah. So I did, um, pilots that, you know, that, that didn't go forward. Um, uh, but I learned a lot about the development process and I spent some time, um, between Dexter and my next job, which was at elementary, I spent some time, you know, working on that development and taking jobs. I took a job on a show called Tyrant. That was a 10 week, um, a consulting producer gig. I did a show called, um, American Odyssey, which was a 12 week, uh, mini room. Like I was taking those kind of jobs so that I could focus on the development and not be, you know, take a long-term deal, which is kind of what I'm doing right now. Like I'm, you know, I've, I've, you know, taken, this is the first time since then that I've taken time off to really focus on development and say, okay, I cannot, you know, go on to a, you know, three-year commitment series right now because I have mm -hmm. to try to, you know, make this investment in myself, which is scary for me because I'm a person who likes to work a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm a person who works all the time. I'm comfortable when I'm doing things like, you know, working on Dexter and writing two pilots, you know, um, that, that's sort of how I normally operate. So it's been very hard to, you know, flip that switch. But, um, you know, what I found is that, you know, when you don't like, I've also given up development. When I took the job in elementary, I had a development project I was very passionate about, but it was like, I got offered this job in elementary. It was 24 episodes, CBS on the air, you know, it was a big deal job. And it was that, or a development project that still hadn't been sold to a, to a network yet. And I was like, I just bought a house, you know, <laughs> like I gotta, I, I gotta take the, I, I gotta take the money and run right now. And so, yeah. um, I did two seasons of elementary. Um, and then funnily enough, that development project that, um, that I had to give up for elementary two years later came back to me because they developed it with someone else. They weren't happy. They sold it to lifetime. Lifetime wasn't happy with it, but lifetime was still interested in redeveloping it. Mm -hmm. And so I started, I felt like it was such a gift that this project had come back to me. It was a book adaptation. I was so excited about it. Started writing it. And then Lifetime was like, we're changing directions. You know, thanks for playing. We'll pay you out. But we don't want to do a show like this. Not, you know, not, no, you know, I hadn't even written it yet. And the producers I was with were like, you don't really have to write it. And I was like, no, 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 I'm writing this. Like, <laughs> I waited too long. And, yeah. um, and it's worked out as a really great sample for me. And, you know, like I, um, and I got to write it the way I wanted to, not the way, you know, not with, you know, hands of, you know, studios and networks and all that. I just wrote it the way I wanted to. I was like, well, it's my project. I'm finishing it. And, um, and so I'm very happy with it. And, you know, I'm like, maybe one day something will happen with it. But like, regardless, you know, um, it's, it's, it's there. <laughs> wow. Well, before we move on to, uh, timeless, I, I just wanted to pause for a second here, um, you make it actually sound pretty easy. 
uh, like you've it's like one show flowed into the next and and this person told you about that and and you got that i mean was it easy was it like somebody told you and you and you got in or or what what are some of the trials and tribulations that happened during that time like what were some of the harder things or or obstacles you had to overcome during that time Um, well, the hard, well, it, the, there were a lot of them. I mean, first I had gotten my first job and I was staffed, you know, on South of Nowhere and everything was great. And then there was a writer's strike and it was right when my show ended. And, you know, and, uh, you know, you have, you know, you have that momentum, you know, when you're coming right off one show and you go to the next and like, I've tried to, to that's why I typically just try to keep going and not take breaks, you know, like I like the, you know, the momentum is a good thing and the momentum all kind of went out the window. And I had suddenly I found myself after that writer's strike with, you know, one credit under my belt on a show on a network nobody really heard of, you know, and, you know, I'm trying to get back in in a in staffing season when everybody hadn't been working. So everybody was hungry. Mm -hmm. Everybody was trying to get jobs. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, I had built a lot of relationships. And that's the advantage of, you know, working as an assistant for a long time. And so um, I was very lucky in that somebody I knew was staffing on and, you know, what? like this was on Legend of the Seeker. Now, normally I might have said, you know what, like fantasy's not my thing. Like that's not the kind of, you know, but instead I really wanted to work and I kept myself open and I wound up loving that job, you know? Mm. So I didn't like get picky about like, oh, you know, it's a syndicated show that's not, you know, going to be classy or, you know, it's fantasy. That's not really my genre. Like I just, you know, I, I just took the opportunity that was in front of me, you know, for a long time. I really just, you know, I, I. I took the opportunities as they came, you know? Mm. Um, and um, I would say that like, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that happens to everybody, but like, if you, if you work on a show and you do a great job uh, and you work, with, you work with a lot of people, they're going to want to work with you again. So I'd say like, be the, you know, when you're, when you get on when you're lucky enough to get one of these jobs, you want to be the most liked person in that room. You want to mm. be somebody that's easy to get along with, you know, because there's a lot of things, you know, there's talent, that's part of it. But there's also, in, particularly for television writing, you can be a really talented feature writer and probably be something of an asshole and nobody will really know or care. But like in television, you got to be super cool to be around. You got to be an easygoing person in the room. You got to be the pe person somebody wants in your room and wants to be in the room with. And so, you know, I think that um, I think that I did that well because people who I worked with prior wanted to work with me again. Um, I also did have representation that was excellent. You know, I was happy with my representation who found things that I might not otherwise have known about. Um, and, um, you know, and I just made myself open to the opportunities. And, you know, when I didn't know something, I faked it, you know. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I didn't, like I said, I, especially early in my career, like I was not picky. I was just thrilled to have opportunities, you know. Um, and, um, you know, and so I would say, um, you know, I would say, you know, it was not easy. And I, you know, and I, you know, everybody has been fired off something like, or, you know, like, I mean, that, that TW pilot you mentioned, I didn't get past the, the outline stage of it. It was kind of a, can I say clusterfuck on your show? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess you just did. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, you can, you can believe that if, if yeah. need be, I don't know your, yeah. I don't know your standards, practices. Hmm. but, um, you know, but that was, you know, that was a pilot that I pitched one thing. I'm not gonna name any names here, but like I pitched something um, that was what I wanted to do. Mm. And um, I signed on to the project, they cut a deal and everything. And then they basically, I was told by the producers that I had to do something completely different from what I had planned. And I tried to make it work a million different ways. And I was like, what is it that you guys want? But it was no longer my vision, you know, mm. and I was trying to make, you know, try, you know, I was trying to make somebody else's vision work. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, they, they ended up cutting me off. Like, this isn't what we want. I'm like, okay, fine. Goodbye. But mm -hmm. like, um, what I learned from that, the biggest thing that I learned from that, you know, and I wasn't really in a position to do so because I was a younger writer at the time. I wasn't, you know, where I am now where I would say, you know what, it's my way or the highway. But I tried so hard to be accommodating and likable. And that works when you're in, when you're in a writer's room and you're, you know, a mid-level writer and you're, you know, the showrunner says, do this. Yes. You try your, you, you work your ass off to like, you know, to service the showrunner's vision because that's your job. Mm. You don't argue with the showrunner what their vision is. You might say, hey, what about this? But if they don't agree with you, it's their show. You service their vision. When it's your show and you, you have to hold on to your vision, you have to be like, hey, guys, this thing you want me to do, this is not my vision, you know, and you have to be a lot more assertive about it than I was because I was used to being the good soldier 
And, you know, like, okay, you want me to do that? I can do that. I can do whatever you want. Well, I didn't have a vision for what they wanted it to be and they didn't have a vision. And so, um, you know, that, that became a, a problem. And of course it was, I was miserable and I was devastated. And at the time it felt like it was the end of the world, but, um, I lived to see another job. I lived to work again. And, you know, um, and, um, you know, it didn't, you know, I would say like, you know, th those things happen to everybody and it didn't ultimately, you know, it didn't destroy my career. Like I moved on to other things and, and, um, you know, very yeah. cool. And we're going to talk about a couple of those other things as soon as we hear from our sponsors. We're going to take a quick break to do that now. Drivingfootage.com provides 4K nine-angle driving plates for film and television. Over 14,000 clips are available for locations all around Southern California, with more areas coming soon. A fully equipped camera car with height-adjustable rig is available for custom shoots and second-unit photography. Get more realistic driving shots so your viewer will pay attention to the story. Visit drivingfootage.com for details. avgearguide.com provides computer and gear rentals serving the LA area, including laptops with final draft, as low as $9 a day with long booking rates available. They also scan photos, documents, video and audio tapes, and film reels to digital so you can easily share with your friends and family. Mention the name of the TV Writer Podcast and you will get 10% off your order. Visit avgearguide.com for details. Full disclosure, I do own both of these companies. By supporting them, you help me bring new in-person video interviews to you. And we're back. And I know that you have told me that you love talking about Timeless. So that's what we're going to talk about now, which, which is very cool because that was also your first experience um, running the room, right? Uh, was that your first experience? Yes, it was. Yeah. So tell, yes, tell me absolutely. about that experience, uh -huh. getting the show and what it was like to to run the room for the first time. Sure. Um, so I started on that show as a co-EP. Um, that was a sh that was a show that was created by um, two geniuses who I adore, um, Sean Ryan and Eric Kripke. And um, I didn't know either of them before getting the job. Um, a lot of there were, you know, the, the other writers on staff, most of them had come from uh, either, either Kripke's camp or Ryan's camp, one or the other. And um, I was somebody who was new to them. And so this was definitely a case where my agent put me in the right place. But mm. um, my wife worked for Sony at the time and Sony made that pilot. And she was like, you have to see this. You're going to love this. Now, mm. for me, I love history. I've wanted to do a history show forever. I've wanted to do a period piece. And after having done Dexter and Elementary back to back, I was like, I need to do something fun. I need to do something fun, light, you know, funny mm. with a lot of a lot of depth, of course, but like, I, you know, I, I can't be ta thinking about serial killers and horrible people and <laughs> yeah. or like pieces of humanity anymore. I can't do it. So um, I really wanted something different and I really wanted to do history. And this show just fell into my lap. And, you know, my wife was like, you're going to love this. And, you know, it wasn't this, like, I was like time travel, you know, it was, it was, it was the history that got me. It was like, oh, wait, this isn't, this isn't a sci-fi geeky time travel show. This is a history show, you know, and I just fell in love with it. And the premise of this show, you know, was three people going back in time to save history. And it was a white woman, a white man and a black man and all of their, and, and what Sean and Eric did so brilliantly was that they leaned into that. They didn't, you know, they didn't just try to say, Oh, these are three people going back in time. Uh, we dealt every, every episode, we dealt with issues of race and gender and history and I learned a lot from doing that. It was like, wow, I learned that history is all about race, you know, and gender to a lesser extent. Like, you know, every episode we had to be like, can Rufus go here? What do we do with Rufus? You know, hmm. and, um, you know, uh, this is this is a tangent of mine, but it is because one of the, it's, it's, it's why I love this show so much and why I was so passionate about getting about getting on this show. And I think that one of the things that you can the most important thing you can do um, when um, meeting with showrunners when, you know, applying for any show is convey how passionate you are about the show. Mm. And that is how I got that job. You know, when, like I said, I didn't know either of the showrunners going into it, but I was like, I love your show. This is my favorite pilot this year. This is the show I want to be on. This is what I want to do. Um, and so I was hired as a co-EP, um, and, uh, for the first season. And then, um, as, as people know, our show was famous for dying and coming back. Yeah. And so More after the once. first Yes. After the first season, we were canceled. And then like Jesus, three days later, we were on camp. <laughs> uh, we came back. And, um, and then when we came, but by the time we came back and we're brought back for our second season, 
Um, Sean was busy with his show called SWAT and Eric was busy with his show called The Boys. And so they were debating whether to bring in a new showrunner or bump um, uh, myself uh, and uh, another writer, Tom Smuts, up. And they decided to bump us up. And so myself, uh, Tom Smuts, and I became the showrunners for season two. Um, But what was great about doing that was like, Sean and Eric were still there. So like Mm -hmm. we, you know, it wasn't like just being, you know, thrown into the fire. Like we had mentors, we had people that we could call and say, hey, so this is going on. You know, we could kind of test stuff out. And while we were running the room in the day-to-day basis and we were running set and we were doing all that stuff, we had people that we could call and they were still very much, you know, involved. They still, you know, sort of approved ultimately the creative direction, things like that. And um, I would say, I think that's the best way uh, for me, it was the best way to start show running because, you know, we had such, you know, we had such great teachers, I would mm. say, um, going into that. And so, so had you, um, been a number two before, like had you run the room sort of when they were absent and things like that, or was this just brand new for you? Uh, I had run the, I mean, you know, I had run the room for, you know, for my episodes and yeah, I mean, I had taken some of that, you know, during the, during the time there as a co-EP, you know, I had kind of, um, you know, I filled in as, you know, sort of being, you know, one of three number twos there. And so, um, yeah, so I had done, I had taken some leadership prior to that. I mean, there must've been some reason that they trusted me. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very yeah. cool. So, so what was that experience like? And especially, I mean, it's not, unfortunately not a great experience being on a, on a bubble show that is just, will it be canceled? Will, won't it be canceled? Mm-hmm. But still your f- first chance to, to show run. Um, tell me about it. Well, um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the good and the bad. The good is it was such a great show. Like creatively, it was like the most satisfying experience of my life. Like we had so much fun, um, you know, with, with the history and we got to make a new time period every week. I mean, we would come to set and it'd be like, oh my God, it's, you know, New York in 1919 or it's, you know, like here we are in, uh, you know, 1942 Hollywood, you know, I mean, like we, we like what our what our crew was able to do. The oh, the downside amazing. of that was it kills it kills the crew. I mean, yeah. like it was it was hard on the crew. It was hard on the actors. Our first season we were in Vancouver. Um, our second season we moved to L.A. Um, and uh, um, you know it was you know it was there were certain things that were easier to do in Vancouver and certain things that were easier in L.A. But it was certainly better to be home um, mm-hmm. for all of that. And, and um, I was able to Tom and I were able to be on set more because you know we were home. And so we were able to like run in when there was a problem or, you know, show up at set all the time and stuff. So that was, um, you know, that, uh, so, so that helped a little bit, but it was, I mean, it was, it was tough on the crew to, you know, create all these things. And so it was a, it was a financially challenging show. It was an expensive show. Mm -hmm. You know, we were always, you know, we were always trying to, where can we save a dollar? Like every episode was like, we got to get this down. We got to cut this down. What can we lose? What do we need? You know, and everything, it was, there were a lot of battles. There were battles all the time, you know, with just, you know, what, what we were going to have to give up, what scenes we were going to have to cut, what characters we were going to have to cut, what, you know, just to try to, to try to make that budget, you know, Hmm. Um, because we weren't like a standard procedural, you know, like what a medical, medical show has to do every week, you know, just, you know, on most, mostly on the stages, you know, that sort of thing. We were, you know, literally, you know, we had one standing set, um, which our first season was Mason Industries. Our second season was The Bunker. Like yeah. we, you know, it was it was present day, and most of our show took place in the past. Everything else in the past, you know, we had to sort of cut from whole cloth every episode. Mm. And so, um, um, but it taught it taught me a a lot about make things for a budget. I mean, I I learned so much doing that show of like how to figure out okay, how do we make this work? How do we make this work? Um, mm. The frustrating part, the most frustrating part, was when we found out they were going to put us on at ten o'clock on Sunday nights after a game show. And we were like, we're going to get lost. Like, we're a family-friendly show. This is the show I watch with my kids, you know? Yeah. Like, 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 we don't belong at 10. We're, not, we're never a 10 o'clock show. And that was the problem season one, was they put us on at 10 o'clock after The Voice. And it was just not, well, while The Voice, you know, it was supposed to be this big, it wasn't the same audience, you know, mm-hmm. that it didn't, it didn't transfer well. And, you know, we were like, we're kid-friendly. You need to put us on earlier. And they didn't, you know, they kind of just put us, they, they sort of burned off their episodes on the episode Sunday nights at 10. And while we did have a really great audience, like on Hulu and delayed watching and all that, like nobody was watching us when we aired. Nobody mm-hmm. was watching us during time. 
Yeah, that's too bad. But um, you did get a very, yeah. very rare thing. Uh, I mean, I, I can't think of very many shows that have had this experience of being able to come back just to tie things up. Yes. So that, you know, the first time we came back, it was very much credited to the fans brought us back, the fans brought us back. And, you know, I mean, I, I, that certainly played a role, but really like it was, you know, Sony and NBC were deal making and like, you know, that's what happened with the movie. The fans brought us back. I mean, the fans were trolling NBC's message, message boards. Every time NBC <laughs> announced like, some new project, the fans got on there and they were like, yeah, that's great. What about time loss? Like <laughs> the fans were, and Sony and they didn't want, they wanted nothing to do with it. And both of them were like, Okay, fine. Okay. I wouldn't say everybody. There were people, by the way, there were people who were passionate about this, you know, at both places, but, mm. you know, sort of the, you know, as the corporate entities, you know, in as much as they are people were not interested in this because it wasn't a moneymaker. Mm. And they were like, okay, we're going to give you two hours, you know, make it a Christmas movie and you can have it. You know, we got to <laughs> fill a slot at Christmas time. If you can make this a Christmas movie, then we will, you know, we'll, we will manage to make this thing happen. We know we're not going to make any money off it, but you can finish off your show. Wow. And so we were like, great, great, great. And then we were like, Christmas, huh? Okay. <laughs> well, it wasn't really Christmas when we left off with a major cliffhanger, but we'll figure that out. And um, yeah, and we found um, an amazing Christmas, amazing historical Christmas story to tell um, that had to do with the, uh, the end of the Korean War and a boat full of refugees being rescued in something that was called the Christmas Miracle. Yeah, very, very cool. Um, yeah, we, I, you know, our family is big fans of the show. We, we just love that show. Um, yeah. It's hard not to like that one. Um, yeah. I, I, were you, you're probably, you might be too young, but there was a show called Voyagers with John Eric Hexum back in the oh, 80s. Oh, I remember Voyagers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that. <laughs> I love that love you that think that I'm show. too young to remember them. Yeah, uh -huh. I remember Voyagers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've always yeah. been a fan of the genre and you know, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a history geek. I mm -hmm. fucking love history. <laughs> and um, this was a chance to like do a different piece of history every episode. Like, you know, how can you not love it? Yeah. Very, very, very cool. So, so you, you had your first show running experience. Uh, obviously the show didn't end up going past that Christmas wrap up. Um, but uh, tell me about, what happened then and you you did get your chance to for the first time start a show from scratch um staff that show and and um be able to to, to run it from from the beginning tell me about that yeah um the first thing i learned was it's a lot harder to run a show from scratch than it is to um you know take something that's been so well positioned by the brilliant creators of the show, it was a lot easier to sort of take the reins of something that was already in motion than it was to, you know, create something from whole cloth. You know, there was a lot more, you know, you, there were, you know, a lot more stutter steps, a lot more like, you know, oh wait, we didn't get the right person figuring that stuff out and all, you know, and all of that. Um, I got the job. This was definitely an agency thing. Um, the creator of that show um, was a novelist from San Francisco um, who didn't have a whole lot of television experience. And so they hired me to uh, work with him to, um, you know, bring my television experience to his creation. And um, we, uh, you know, we did 10 episodes. We shot in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, um, where I spent most of my summer. It wow. was it was intense. I mean, a first season show is always intense, but definitely, you know, having never seen that kind of level from the showrunner's, you know, point of view, I mean, it was all encompassing. I was working 100% of the time. Um, and, I, and like I said, I like to work, so you know, no complaints about that, but it was definitely, it was definitely hard. Um, staffing up the room, um, was, um, was fun. It was interesting because we were starting up in January. And so a lot of, and this is during, you know, this is, this is sort of this boom of television. And like so many people were working and we, it was very important for us to build a diverse staff. Now, when I say diverse, I don't, you know, in the, in the you know, there, there's, there's a world where like that's, you know, entirely racial diversity and that was part of it. And that was important to me, but we wanted a room that was diverse in terms of age, in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of economic levels, like in terms of socioeconomic background, in terms of, you know, just life experiences, because I've found that the best rooms are the ones that have sort of a diverse range of life experiences that they can bring to it, you know, even uh, work experiences as well. You know, I know that, like for instance, on Dexter, there were some people who were who came from procedural background and were very good at the procedural, 
you know, kill a week aspect of that show. And there were others like me who came from much more character driven, you know, background. And so like, it was, you know, that, that kind of, you know, those, those kind of mixes of people are what I look for in a room is like, what kind of, you know, what kind of personal background do they have? You know, what kind of, you know, sort of demographic background do they have? And what kind of professional background do they have? What kinds of shows have they done that are similar to this or not similar? What, what, what elements do we want to have in this? And so that's, you know, um, that's what I look for in a room, you know, is like, how do I get people with diverse ranges of, so I know when, you know, for me, I'm terrible at action. Action is just mm. not my thing, you know? And so I need to have, if I'm going to do a show that has any action in it, I'm going to need, who's my go-to person who I can call in, you know, and on timeless, I knew who that was a fantastic writer, Jim Barnes. I would call Jim in and be like, Jim, we got to do an escape. Okay. What happens? You know, <laughs> like I knew, you know, who I could count on for, you know, each aspect of the show. So, um, I think it's diversity on all levels is the most important thing. The number one thing I look for in a room. And, um, and that's not always as easy to find, especially when everybody's working, you know, mm. you start to get to like, wait, I want this diverse room and I can't have my first, second or third choice. I couldn't hire anybody I knew in advance on Paradise Lost because everybody was working. You know, wow. I mean, um, it's so a good it's, problem to have, but <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yes, I'm glad, I was glad everybody was working, but it was very difficult to, you know, like, like I said, if I, you know, if I had my druthers, I would always hire people I know first because I know who I can go to for certain things. You know, I know who I trust. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, but we did, you know, we did, um, you know, manage to find some great writers, you know, who were, you know, in between this and that. And, um, you know, I, um, I love that we got to, you know, we got to explore some, you know, we, we, we had a very small room. But, you know, some people, when they have a small room, they're just going to hire upper levels and that's it. And I, I can see reasons to do that. But we didn't do that. We wanted some fresh voices. We wanted some younger voices. And so we still had a range of levels in the room as well because that was important. Very cool. Well, and that, that's actually a really good segue to the next section is sort of help for writers that are on their way up. Um, you, as you're talking about building a room, how do you know when a person comes in to interview with you i mean first of all i mean you've read their you've read their samples but do you want somebody to come in and and really uh come in strong on what they're good at and and explain to you sort of this is my unique background and that kind of thing yeah um i would say the best things you can do because like there were people who we were super high on when we read their material and after the meeting we're like oh that's too bad you know oh, wow. um yeah. Yeah. That happens all the time because when you come in for the meeting, it's almost, you know, it, it can be, especially, like I said, you know, you're in a writer's room, you're going to be with these people or, you know, maybe in the future virtually with, I don't know, but you're going to be with these people, you know, sometimes 10 hours a day in a room, like you want to know who this person is, who's going to be there. And they can't just bring it on the page. They have to be able to bring it in the room. What I'm looking for from me, I'm looking for one of the top things is, passion and enthusiasm for the show. Like you'd be surprised how many people mess that up. People will wow. come in and they will not say things like, Oh my God, I love this show. Like how simple is that to say, you know, even if you don't, <laughs> by the way, like <laughs> how simple is it to say, I love your show, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and some people would just sort of skip over that. And like, you know, I, you know, I had one meeting with a writer who we were very high on her script and, you know, we were like, Oh, so what'd you think? Of, you know, what, what'd you think of the show? And they were like, Oh yeah, I liked it. You know, I wanted to ask you about, I really loved your show. Well, like they, and it was just like, oh, wow. I, I handed you the opportunity to uh -huh. say great that, you know, like, and it's like people want, you know, and it's not because we want our egos, you know, like, I mean, this, in this case, like it wasn't even a show I created, you know, mm -hmm. like it's because we want somebody who wants to be in that room and coming up with, who's excited about the show and excited about coming up with ideas for the show. And there's always going to be people who bring that. And so if you don't bring that, you're going to be at a disadvantage. So I think enthusiasm for the particular project and specifically what you're excited, what you love about it, being able to articulate what you love about it and not just say, not just say, oh, I love it. You know, like the, those things are key because we want to know, you know, when you're in the room, what are you going to be excited to talk about? Um, the other thing I, you know, we often ask is like, what's your superpower? Like, what do you do really well in the room? Because if I don't know somebody, like I said, there are people I know and I know what they're good at. Yeah. But these people coming in blind, I want to know what you think you're good at in the room. What's the, you know, what's the role that you fill in, you know, in other rooms that you've been in? You know, what are you better at than other people? What do you do that other people aren't doing? How do you, and the thing, you know, 
I love the person who gets out of the box and who can step back from a story when you're in that quagmire of the, why isn't this working? Why isn't this working? I love that person who can be like, you know what? Like, let's put the premise to side and for a second. What if we change it? Like, what if we start, like, we're starting, what, what if we start from, we don't assume that they are, you know, you know, like somebody who brings, you know, brings fresh ideas in, um, you know, like that. Those are the kind of people that I want to have in the room. And I want, and I want to have, you know, it's like in the room, all you want is ideas. You just want the people who can like, you know, throw them out there, who can keep them coming and who's not afraid of having a stupid idea, you know, like, yeah. you know, I, you know, I, you know, I, I, we don't need quiet people in the room. We don't need, you know, unless, unless they're quiet until they come up with a genius thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like you want people who are going to be like, I got another idea. Okay. That's not working. I got another idea. Um, so those are definitely things to uh, present. Um, the other thing is like, just like getting them to know you a little bit, showing a little personality, you know, like I think, um, you know, that's, that's the hardest part for us writers because we're nervous. We're, you know, a lot of us are introverts. A lot of us are, you know, not, you know, exactly, you know, excited to, you know, socialize. We're not natural born comedians necessarily. Some of us are, but like, um, you know, you want to, and you want to make sure you're engaging with the people you want to make sure, you know, you're, um, you know, like, just like any, you know, blind date or like any conversation, you know, you just, you want them, you want, you want them to like get to know you a little bit and like you. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. And, and what about on the page? What, what are you looking for on the page? That depends on the show, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like with Paradise Lost, it was such a like like that particular show was a, a very. I mean, it was the original voice of Rhodes Fishburne who wrote it. Like you know, it was a very charactery show, and um, it was hard in terms of finding samples that were appropriate for it because they're you know it's not the kind of thing people typically have as a sample. Um, but you're looking for a sample that's you know as close as possible to the type of material. Like if it's if it's a dialogue heavy show, you want to see that they can write good dialogue if it's a hardcore procedural show you want to see that they can nail that procedural story um and again that also depends on what you're looking for to round off your room if you have like three if you're if you're doing a say a, like a broadcast procedural straight up csi kind of show and you've got three writers who've done law and order and csi and like all those kind of shows you might want somebody who doesn't do that you might want somebody who's like okay this person had a super character sample you know i want them in the room even though like they're not as experienced so that's I would say, I mean, that varies so much, like what you're looking for. You know, I mean, you're looking for good writing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're looking for something that's good. I like to read pilots. Um, I think mostly people are reading pilots more than spec scripts nowadays. When I started off, you had to have the specs. Yeah. And now I don't know anybody who reads like spec scripts of, you know, pre-existing shows. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't even bother with those mm -hmm. unless you're trying to get into some kind of contest that, you know, requires it. But um, which is funny because in a lot of ways that shows that someone, you know, I mean, there, there's perfectly, they're perfectly valid, yeah. you know, like showing that somebody knows how to do something. It's just sort of fallen out of favor and people really want to get a sense of what's your original voice? Who are you? What would, what do you write when you're not, you know, being told what to write? Yeah. You know, I think uh, that's important. Well, t tell me a little bit, bit about, um, I mean, you, you have a family, you got uh, growing kids, but they're still fairly young. Um, what's your daily writing habit? Like, especially when you're developing and, and there's no sort of schedule imposed on you. Uh, that's harder. I will say, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to juggle a family in a room for sure, but it's harder to, you know, as, as we're all discovering to work mm -hmm. from home and not be distracted. And, you know, like basically, you know, I mean, I've, I've had to, I've had to get disciplined about it. I've had to go, at, you know, be, sort of decide what my work hours are going to be and go and, you know, sort of commit, to what I'm going to do those hours, especially when you're working on multiple projects, you know, mm -hmm. that's hard too, because you're in the headspace of one. And then you're like, no, I got to do this other one, you know, because I'm getting deadlines and I'm getting producers calling me, you know, and I have to, you know, like move, you know, sort of adjust my brain. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I've tried to sort of dedicate, like when I'm working on multiple projects, I'm trying not to divide up the day. My manager was like, well, you should just work three hours on this and two hours on this. And I love him yeah. to death. But I was like, that's not going to work for me. That's yeah. not how my brain works. You know, like I can't, you know, turn off this project at, at, at two o'clock and turn on this project. So I've kind of had to be like, okay, today is about this project. Let that project kind of fill my head space, focus on it for the day and then say, okay, I know tomorrow I'm going to work on this other thing. So in as much as I can do that, I will keep, uh, I keep doing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just like anything else is discipline. You know, I don't think there's any, certainly don't think there's any magic formula, hmm. um, for success at it. <laughs> 
Cool. Well, we are getting to pretty close to the end of the end of okay. our time here, but um, I want to just sort of wrap up with uh, any general advice to somebody who's sort of coming up now, greener writers who, um, you know, they're maybe they were just on staff or, or they're trying to make their way through this, especially in light of um, there's a big work interruption, not unlike a writer's strike, and you're going to have a lot of people really hungry for jobs uh, coming out of this. Uh, well, I mean, I'm new to this situation as well. I mean, we're all kind of feeling our way through it. It is my understanding that um, I think writers' rooms are going to come back up. I think writing, I think, you know, it's crazy because in this pandemic, like, writing actually is something we can still do. It's my understanding that people are still buying projects, you know. In fact, the executives have nothing else to do, so they're like, <laughs> what you got, you know. Yeah. Like, I've had, like I said, I have, like, three projects at different stages, and everybody's calling me, like, okay, when's the pitch? When's that? You know, because they're you know, because they're looking for stuff that we can do right now. We can't, we can't shoot things right now. That's something that's just not physically possible, but we, we can write. And I would say to people that they should, um, you know, now in the, you know, in this marketplace, like keep, you know, submitting as though as it's, you know, it's a regular season because probably virtual rooms will start up. And the most important thing is like, look, you know, I have a family, I'm juggling, you know, whole, you know, kids who are being schooled at home now and all this crazy stuff. Like for young writers who are single, like this is a freaking dream, you know, who can like, you know, you're, you're stuck in your place. You can't go anywhere. Like, write. You know, write something, get a new sample up there, get a, you know, get something out to, you know, get a pitch out and try to sell it. Like I would say, use this if you can as found writing time. I think the disadvantage, the hardest part of this is that like we as parents are hit very hard by this. And like, it is way, way harder to say the same to someone who's a parent, especially of young children where, you know, it's like, we can't, just, you know, um, you know, devote 100% of our time to writing. So if you can do that, and if you can't, you know, it's harder, but keep keep doing as much as you can, what you can be doing. It's my understanding that people are going to be having virtual rooms. I mean, why wouldn't they? We can, hmm. you know? Um, you know, so I think virtual rooms will be starting up. And what I do hear, and I, this is all anecdotal, by the way, so I don't, I, you know, nobody knows anything because we're all sort of, you know, diving into this as we speak in real time. But I think they are trying to, it, with a lot of these virtual rooms, the hours are more family friendly because everyone does understand like, hey, like people are going to have to deal with their kids. And, you know, um, you know, so we're, you know, rooms that would normally go until seven, you know, because everybody's, you know, you've got, you've got all your childcare lined up and whatever, like, People may not have that right now. People may not, you know, be able to do that. And so I think that virtual rooms are going more like ending at three, you know, and so that may now work for some people, depending on the age of your children, but they are trying, you know, and, and your spouse and your care, you know, whatever your caregiver situation, it is going to be a lot harder for parents to juggle this. But I do think that, you know, you should keep submitting if you have an agent, you know, um, who has signed with the the COC, you know, keep working with your agent, encourage them to find, you know, virtual rooms for you. If you don't have an agent, if you have a manager or whatever, keep doing that. And um, I do believe that these virtual rooms will need assistance because they will need somebody to manage the whole virtual thing and to take notes and stuff. So uh, my advice for anybody, you know, who is not yet staff remains get in a room, try to be an assistant. And it's going to be a fuck of a lot harder right now. Sorry, I, I swear a lot. Um, it's going to be a lot harder right now to get to know writers when you're, you know, in boxes, but this will not go on forever. This is a, you know, temporary situation. And I would still say that ultimately, you know, the, the best thing that people could do who want to break into this business is like, try to get into these rooms and get to know writers because that, they will be your most valuable resource, you know, more than anything you could ever learn well. elsewhere. I think that is a great place to end up, and I really appreciate you taking all your time. Um, and uh, best of luck with all your development projects that are coming. Thank you. Thanks so much. You can find dedicated audio-only feeds of this podcast at iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, and Pandora. You can access the video versions via YouTube, iTunes, Podbean, and on the web at tvwriterpodcast.com. Follow me on Twitter at Gray Jones is my handle, and be sure to like us and post reviews on all of these aggregators. During the Shelter at Home order in April and May 2000, we'll be posting weekly episodes on Mondays. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.